chapter 13. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam began Abijah to reign over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. And then we have some details about that. And then in verse 5, Abijah addresses uh, the other side, the ten tribes. Verse 5, Ought ye not to know that Jehovah, the God of Israel, gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt? But Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord. And vain men, sons of Belial, gathered to him and strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And Rehoboam was young and faint-hearted and did not show himself strong against them. And now, ye think to show yourselves strong against the kingdom of Jehovah in the hand of the sons of David, and ye are a great multitude, and ye have with you the golden calf that Jeroboam made you for God. Have ye not cast out the priests of Jehovah, the sons of Aaron, and the Levites, and made you priests as the peoples of the land? Whoever comes to consecrate himself as a young bullock and seven rams, he becomes a priest of what is not God. But as for us, Jehovah is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests that serve Jehovah are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites are at their work, and they burn to Jehovah every morning and every evening burnt offerings and sweet incense. The loaves also are set in order upon the pure table, and a candlestick of gold with its lamps to burn every evening. For we keep the charge of Jehovah our God, but ye have forsaken him. And behold, we have God with us at our head, and his priests, and the loud sounding trumpets to sound an alarm against you. Children of Israel, do not fight with Jehovah, the God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. But Jeroboam caused an ambush to come about behind them, and they were before Jehovah, uh, Judah, and the ambush behind them. And Judah looked back, and behold, they had the battle in front and behind. And they cried to Jehovah, and the priests sounded with the trumpets. And the men of Judah gave a shout, and as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. Verse 18, And the children of Israel were humbled at that time, and the children of Judah were strengthened, because they relied upon Jehovah, the God of their father. 22, The rest of the acts of Abijah and his ways and his sayings are written in the treatise, treatise of the prophet Edo. Verse, chapter 14, verse 1. And Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his stead. In his days the land was quiet ten years. And Asa did what was good and right in the sight of Jehovah, his God. And he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places, and broke the columns, and cut down the Asherahs, and commanded Judah to seek Jehovah, the God of their fathers, and to practice the law and the commandments. And he removed out of all the cities of Judah the high place and the sun images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. And he built fortified cities in Judah, for the land had rest, and he had no war in those years, because Jehovah had given him rest. And he said to Judah, Let us build these cities, and surround them with walls and towers, gates and bars, while the land is yet before us. For we have sought Jehovah our God, we have sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. And they built and prospered. And then we have this great battle when the king of Ethiopia or with Egyptians came up and God gave the victory. We read in verse 11, And Asa cried unto Jehovah his God and said, Jehovah, it makes no difference to thee to help, whether there be much or no power will help us, O Jehovah our God, for we rely on thee and in thy name have we come against this multitude. Jehovah, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. And Jehovah smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah. Chapter 15, verse 1. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. Jehovah is with you, 
while ye are with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. In verse 8, and when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominations out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and renewed the altar of Jehovah. Verse 9, and he assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell away to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that Jehovah his God was with him. And then in verse 10 we see this was the third month of the year, of his 15th year. In verse 12, they entered into a covenant to seek Jehovah, the God of their fathers, with all their heart and with all their soul. And that whoever would not seek Jehovah, the God of Israel, should be put to death. Verse 14, they swore to Jehovah with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they took the oath with all their heart and sought him with the whole desire, and he was found of them. And Jehovah gave them rest round about. Verse 18, And he brought into the house of God the things which his father had dedicated. Then chapter 16, we see the war with Basha, the king of Israel. And then in verse 2, Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of Jehovah and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt at Damascus, saying, and so on. And then, verse 7, At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said upon, unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and hast not relied on Jehovah thy God, therefore has the army of the king of Syria escaped out of thy hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? But when thou didst rely on Jehovah, he delivered them into thy hand. For the eyes of Jehovah run turned through, through the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, for from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in prison, for he was enraged with him because of this, and Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. And then he fell ill, sick, and we see that he did not seek, in verse 12, he did not seek Jehovah, but the physicians. And so he died. This is um, a lot to cover, but um, I hesitated in the beginning to take up four chapters. They are not that long, but it is good to have the chapters together and to compare certain things together with the Lord's help tonight. Um, if you compare chapter 13, the story of Abijah, with the report in First Kings, then you don't have all these details that we have read tonight. In fact, the report there is that he was a bad king, that he did what was bad in the Lord's eye. So that was the overall picture. But we are here in a book of recovery. And may I suggest to you that what we find here in Abijah, although he is qualified as a bad king in first kings, there are two ways we can look at these things. Either that at the end of his life there was this re recovery, or that there was a, an appearance of recovery. But anyway, we see there is great emphasis on the things that God had given originally to Israel and that had a place of value among them. So when we... Uh, see here this king in verse 1 and 2, uh, his name means my father is Jah. So that is uh, remarkable, he uh, realized, or at least the name expresses the relationship between God and his people, and uh, an intimate relationship. Secondly, the name of his mother was Micaiah, meaning who is like Jehovah, who is like Jah. And she was the daughter of Uriel, meaning uh, El, God, is my life. So these are wonderful names. And then we see in verse 3 that he had this war against the ten tribes. Uh, we have seen the last time that Rehoboam was not qualified to do this. He wanted to wage war against the ten tribes because of their unfaithfulness and rebellion. But he was the last uh, one that could be used in this. So then the prophet came up, we have seen that the last time, and he listened to the prophet, and he sent his soldiers back. But now, 
we have a different situation and uh, the initiative was probably taken by the ten tribes to uh, uh, attack the two tribes. And so there's a different setting. And in verse 5, we see that Abijah addresses the ten tribes. Now, these details we don't find in Kings, and they are very interesting. They deal also with the house of God. You remember that Chronicles deals with the house of God. And there are many, many details here in these chapters that are very uh, helpful for us also today in connection with the house of God. And we will see there's an intimate connection between the kingdom and the priesthood. We see that all the way through, that the Lord will reign in the millennium as the king priest on the throne of Jehovah. So we see here also an intimate connection between priesthood and uh, the king, royalty. And that's not strange for us today either, before we know First Peter 2, that we are priests and kings, a royal priesthood. And so we find these two elements now represented today in the assembly. Now, to go on with verse 5, where he starts his message to uh, them, and I want to underline four points. First of all, um, that the kingdom over Israel was given by God to David forever. That was God's covenant, everlasting covenant with David. We have seen that in First Chronicles 17. It's referred to in, in Psalm 132 and other places. Uh, confirmed by God in Psalm 89. Psalm 89 is really a psalm that gives much detail about this everlasting covenant between God and David. But then, of course, we see in David the true David, our Lord Jesus. As we have sung of him in his wonderful name. The point that I want to underline in this context is a covenant of salt, the end of verse 5. So that is to underline that this was a covenant that could not be recalled, that could not be made in, invalid. But what Abijah does not stress here, that is, the, the responsibilities the kings had in the line of David. In fact, later on in Jeremiah and other places, you see that because of their infidelity, in, because of their unfaithfulness, God had to say that in that line of those kings, uh, the Messiah could not come. And then God used another line of descendants from David, as we find in Luke 3, the genealogy, and via Mary, the Messiah was born. But not from the line where you have the official king, as you find in Matthew 1. Joseph, from that line, was not the um, physical father, of course, of the Lord Jesus. He was his, um, his uh, legal father, uh, and uh, adopted him, in a sense, to be his son before the law. So, the point is, what Abijah does not stress here, that is his own responsibility. And I think we can learn from this. We may say, we may think about God's plans and God's purposes, wonderful. But what about our responsibility? That is something that he overlooked. And that is why God allowed this division. We have seen that earlier. Because of the unfaithfulness of Solomon. The second point I want to underline, verse 6, is the fact that indeed Jeroboam rebelled. So, uh, again, Abijah is right here. There was rebellion. And I want you to think about this point in terms of the history of the church. Paul, in Acts 20, when he uh, warns the uh, Ephesian elders, he spoke about what was going to happen. And so, I would suggest there is a clear parallel between the history of Israel, if you find, for example, in the book of Judges, and also in the book of Kings, and here details in Chronicles, on the one hand, and the history of the church, on the other hand. And in the history of the church, we also find this rebellion. That there was a movement against God, against the authority of the Lord Jesus. Now, just to tie this in with the salt covenant. God had given the Levites, and you find the salt covenant in Numbers 18, in connection with the Levitical service. God speaks about the salt in connection with the meal offering. Uh, Leviticus 2, and I mentioned this, it's so important for us to study those scriptures. Leviticus 2 deals with the humanity of the Lord Jesus, and there you see that uh, the meal offering, the salt, could not be missed. And we see this reality in the Lord Jesus. Well, that's the key. I mentioned uh, Abijah refers to the plans of God, but he skips his own responsibility. Whereas in the Lord Jesus we see both. We see God's plans and a response in the Lord's life 
total obedience and commitment, there you find the salt. And God wants both. His plans on the one hand, but then the salt on the other hand. And the salt was, of course, not found in the rebellion. There is a lack of it also. But the point is, there was a lack of salt in Abijah and in his people, those who wanted to follow the Lord. The third point we find in uh, verse 8, there was an, um, a reference there that uh, Jeroboam and uh, those with him made themselves strong against the kingdom of the Lord, against the kingdom of Jehovah. Remember Exodus 19, Israel was a kingdom of priests, to be a kingdom of priests. Um, and we have seen in First Chronicles that Solomon was seated on the throne of Jehovah. So the thought of a kingdom is very prominent there. And so we also are in the kingdom of God. And then we find the next verse, verse 9, deals with the priest. So I just want to ask your attention about the intimate connection between royalty on the one hand and priesthood on the other hand, either in connection with the history of Israel or in connection with us. Now, in connection with the kingdom, we see here that they turned away from the Lord's authority and followed the golden calves. Golden calves is really a counterfeit. Find already in Exodus 32, the golden calf. It's a counterfeit Lord. And behind the golden calf, of course, is uh, the power of Satan uh, and um, uh, demons. And we have to be aware of that. First Corinthians 10 warns against idolatry, that we should flee from idolatry and shows that we cannot provoke the Lord behind these influences from the days of Babylon, Genesis 10 and 11, are demonic forces at work, and they were here at work in a very evident way, in this counterfeit religion, this imitation, these alternatives of the enemy. Well, you find much more about this in 1 Kings 12. There you see how he had, uh, advised it from his own heart, he, uh, a different, he set a different date, different place, it was really an alternative, a great deviation, and in that sense, a rebellion. And that does not, um, it is not far away from us. This can happen to us, that we would rebel against the authority of the Lord, or that we would come up as an alternative. So, may we be very careful and uh, be kept in the right path. In verse 9, then, there is great emphasis on the priesthood, but... The true priests of the Lord were rejected by Jeroboam and the ten tribes. And this happened in the history of the church also. Not only the rights of the Lord Jesus as king were rejected, as Lord were rejected, also the true priesthood of the believers, as we have mentioned first Peter, was rejected and replaced by clergy and uh, corrupted in many ways. We find in Revelation 2 already, leading to the great Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18. And there are other references how, the, uh, how things were corrupted in the very early days already of the apostles. There's also an element here. Uh, whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, he becomes a priest of what is not God. So there we see the self-appointed uh, priest who would have enough resources to come, enough money to provide these sacrifices, and they would be instituted as priests by this apostate king Jeroboam. So these are four elements we find there. Uh, but then in contrast to this development among the ten tribes, Abijah underlines where he stood for with his people. Verse 10. But as for us, Jehovah is our God. As his name already expressed. That's beautiful. Now, here are two things that I want to underline. On the one hand, what Abijah says here sounds very great, very wonderful. This is the truth. But if it is only the truth in our orthodoxy, or by way of tradition, it's not, much, not worth much. So, I think what the Spirit of God would like to bring out here is not just orthodoxy, but is that the people of God would really be in the good of these things. Now, apply these things for us today. We can uh, say, well, by the grace of God, we have uh, received many things in the recovery uh, last century. God has brought back the truth as he had given in the days of the apostles. And we might have great claims of orthodoxy and uh, right doctrine and so on. But, of course, God wants also reality, as we've seen. God wants the salt at the same time. Let's not forget that. But the points he mentioned are, are good. Uh, verse 10, we have not forsaken him. That is a beautiful 
uh, point. And uh, we find in this book many times that Israel did forsake the Lord. So here Abijah and his people, they could say, we have not forsaken him. Whereas later on, we will see uh, what happened with uh, Asa. And then we see the priests are functioning, the Levites are functioning, and then in verse 11, uh, what were they doing? Four points, every morning and every evening a burnt offering. In our hymns we thought much of the Lord Jesus. Well, we have seen in the book of Exodus, chapter 29 already, these uh, daily burnt offerings, continual burnt offerings. God wants to be reminded of the value of Christ as the morning and evening burnt offering. And he wants us to be occupied with such a service as priests, to present Christ as the true burnt offering. That is his sacrifice. But then also to present him as sweet incense. That refers to his personal excellencies, as we have expressed in our hymns tonight. That's the incense. And then the third point, the loaves also are set in order. And that's beautiful uh, in connection with the table of showbread, the table of the presentation of the bread before the Lord, representing his people. But what is his people? That is really Christ expressed in the people of God. The loaves there really speak of Christ, but as seen in his people. God wants to see Christ in you and me. God wants to see Christ in his people. And so he wants to set the loaves in order upon a pure table. There's two elements to stress. The order is God's order. And then the pure table where we see that uh, purity, God's rights are maintained. God is a holy God. God is a righteous God. And this is maintained in connection with the pure table. The fourth point is the candlestick. Again, we think of the Lord. He gives light. He gives light in the holy place, in connection with the uh, Levitical service. He gives light, whatever question we may have. And so Christ is the light, as we know from John's Gospel. So these wonderful details, they refer to Christ in many different ways. And may we be helped by the Spirit of God that we may function, not in, a, in the way of the shadows of the Old Testament, but now in reality, as we find in Hebrews, for example. So, again, here is the, this line of recovery. The Holy Spirit comes back to God's original thought. And although they are only kept in a remnant, it's worthwhile to write it down. And another point I want to underline is this, for we keep the charge of Jehovah our God. This is wonderful. If you study the scriptures, this word, uh, keep the charge, or similar expressions, are found many, many times, especially in the book of Numbers, where you have this uh, service of God in the wilderness, uh, maintained in wilderness position, as a testimony for God in this wilderness. And you find this expression many times in the books of Chronicles. That's very remarkable in connection with the house of God. And then also in Ezekiel, also in connection with the house of God. Ezekiel 40 to 48, you find this expression about the charge of Jehovah or many, many times. And of course, also in other books, but Numbers, Chronicles, Ezekiel are uh, really emphasizing this thought a lot in connection with the house of God. But then, note in verse 12, but ye have forsaken him. That's a very grave accusation. And so in this book we, spe we see two lines. We see the, lines, the line of God's faithfulness and he will not forsake his people. On the other hand we see the line of man's failures. How man forsook God in many, many uh, ways. It's a line from Adam and Eve till the end of man's history. A line of failure. And so that is also an underlying point in this book. But Based on that uh, line of failure, we see the work of the Holy Spirit for restoration. And then verse 12, and behold, we have God with us. That's another point Abijah underlines here. Now again, you can make a mistake there. If it is only said in orthodoxy, as the people uh, in the days of Jeremiah uh, claimed to have the, the temple and the temple of the Lord, uh, they, made, they had great claims. And, for example, Jeremiah 7, verse 4, they say, Jehovah's temple, Jehovah's temple, Jehovah's temple is this. But then Jeremiah says, do not trust in words of falsehood. So, there is a claim of orthodoxy, but God was not in it. The salt was not there. So, again, there is this possibility that was just an outward claim without the true salt of the covenant. But the words themselves, let's con focus on the words. Wonderful. We have God with us. Matthew 1, we see the Lord Jesus. What's his name? Emmanuel. God with us. 
What does the Lord present in Matthew 11? Come to me, take my yoke upon you. And there he goes with his people, with his disciples, individually. Matthew 18, I am with you. Where two or three are gathered in my... I am with you. Matthew 28, I am with you. All the days, till the completion of the age. That's a wonderful promise. And if we can really claim that promise, in reality, with the two souls, wonderful. And he says, we have God at our head. With us, that's one thing, his company. But also, he gives the lead. He is the leader. Wonderful elements here, he underlines. And then this, the loud sounding trumpets. Again, you find it in the wilderness journey. In Numbers 10, how important they were. Many uh, things are connected with the loud sounding trumpets. And so his conclusion is, at the end of verse 12, children of Israel do not fight with Jehovah, the God of your father. Sounds like Gamaliel's advice to the leaders of Israel in those days, not to fight against the Christians. And we see that the Lord, when the Lord appeared to, uh, to Saul of Tarsus, what did the Lord say? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was persecuting the people of God and... Uh, we see there an intimate link between the Lord in the glory and his people on this earth. Much more intimate, of course, than the, the link between Jehovah and his people on this earth at that time. But there is a parallel. And so, Abijah says, don't fight against God. Don't fight against his people. For ye shall not prosper. But then Jeroboam didn't listen. He put up this ambush. And in this distress, what do we read in verse 14? They cried to Jehovah. I want to underline, it says, they cried. It does not say that Abijah cried to the Lord. As it says of Asa in chapter 14, when this overwhelming power came against him, we see that Asa cried unto Jehovah, 14 verse 11. It's not said here in chapter 13 verse 14, but it said of the people with Abijah, they cried to Jehovah. So we don't know whether he was included in this or not. But this is another point you could study in much detail in the scriptures. When, when people cry to the Lord, cast themselves on the Lord, he comes in, he gives help. There are so many occasions that you find this. I cannot go over these uh, occasions now. You can do that at home. But when the people of God cry to the Lord, he comes in and helps them. For example, when they were around Jericho and the, the trumpets were sounded, the alarm was sounded, then God came in. As it happened here in verse 15, God smote Jeroboam. And God delivered them into their hands. And in verse 18, the children of Israel were humbled at that time. But in contrast to that, we, saw, we find that the children of Judah were strengthened. Because, and that's another word that I really want to emphasize, they relied upon Jehovah, the God of their fathers. You could translate this word, they leaned upon Jehovah, the God of their fathers. There's a wonderful expression you find in many, many uh, verses. Um, to give uh, the uh, sense of the word, you remember the story of Samson when he was brought in the house of the Philistines and the house of the Philistines rested on two pillars. It relied on two pillars. That's the same word you have here. As that house relied on the two pillars. So, here we see the thought that the people relied upon the Lord. So, we should rely upon the Lord. And Solomon says in Proverbs 3, don't rely on your own intelligence. Rely on the Lord. And so we find in fact with the future remnant, when they will be in distress, they will rely upon the Lord as they cried here to the Lord. They will do that in the future. Many references to that in the scriptures. They will lean upon the Lord. And now it's up to you and me today to rely on the Lord. And then we find also in verse uh, 20, that God dealt with Jeroboam later on, not at that time exactly, but a bit later on, Jehovah smote him. That happened to Nabal, the fool, mentioned in First Samuel 25, and so here we see that God smote Jeroboam, because he also had acted as a fool. How tragic this is. And then verse 21, but Abijah strengthened himself. The word used here for strengthening occurs many times in this book. It's the same word you find in the name Hezekiah. He strengthened himself in the Lord, in prayer, in his faith. And his name also means strengthening. You've seen at the beginning of Second Chronicles that Solomon strengthened himself in the Lord. And sometimes this word is translated, be strong, be firm. So it's up to us to strengthen ourselves in the Lord, 
Second Timothy 2 uh, strengthen uh, as, as Paul um, exhorted Timothy to strengthen himself in the Lord Jesus and in his grace so we may strengthen ourselves today then uh, Ido when he made this treatise or this report the word uh, originally means seek so Ido the prophet has sought all these details out to make this report and uh, his name means his witness so we see the prophet as a witness of God. So this report is a faithful report made by Edo, the prophet of God. So then we come to the next story in chapter 14. After Abijah, we find Asa, his son. Now Asa is the first king mentioned in this book as a good king. He reigned 41 years and he's qualified as a good king. So, I mean, that's the first in the line of uh, after the division of the kingdom. And we find four points I want to underline in connection with Asa's history. First of all, his reform. He did what was good and right in the sight of Jehovah. In connection with Hezekiah, chapter 31, we find that Hezekiah did also what was good and right, but also what was true. Hezekiah, we find a, a deeper revival than in Asa's day. But still, it was good reform. And many lessons also for us, practical lessons for us today. For example, verse 3, he took away the altars of the strange God. Do we have altars in connection with strange God? If our affections are set on other things besides God, it is strange God. Uh, John says, 1 John 5, children, keep yourselves from the idols. It's a very appropriate warning for each one of us. We are so prone to be led astray, to be influenced by those influences all around. Idolatrous influences. Uh, Jacob had to exhort his children to uh, cleanse themselves from those influences. Moses exhorted the people. And so here we see that Asa had to do the same. And in the New Testament, many warnings. Second Corinthians 7, for example. 6 and 7. And then he was very radical. He cut down the Asherahs. He broke the columns. He took the altars away. So very radical, according to the instructions given by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. And you remember that the king was supposed to read Deuteronomy. He puts into practice the instructions from the book of Deuteronomy. Verse 4, and commanded Judah. He takes a spiritual leadership, position of leadership. He leads the people in the good direction to seek the Lord. In contrast to the false prophets who would try to lead the people in the wrong direction to seek uh, other gods. And uh, in verse 5, he removed out of all the cities of Judah the high places. So this is, as it were, a summary of this restoration and reform under Asa. And in verse 6, the land had rest. There are four references in connection with Asa and his, the first part of his reign that the Holy Spirit emphasized this quiet, the quiet ten years in verse 14, and the rest in verse 6, and rest again at the end of verse 6, and rest in verse 7. So this is wonderful. When things are in order, God gives rest. God gives peace. And again, many verses could be uh, mentioned where we find this practical rest as a result of obedience. And then we see uh, that's the second point in connection with Asa, the attack of the Ethiopians, or perhaps Egyptians, together with Ethiopians. And it was a tremendous uh, force that came against him in verse 9. The name Zera means rising. So there was another power rising up against uh, Asa. But it came from far away. And God gave the victory. We see that Asa cried unto Jehovah his God. Verse 11. And in verse 11, I want to underline three points. His faith that we see. He says, Job, it makes no difference to thee to help whether there be much or no power. It's similar to what Jonathan said uh, to his companion in 1 Samuel 14 when he went out against the Philistines. The second point in verse 11, O Jehovah our God, we rely on thee. That is the secret we have seen in the story of Abijah. And here... As it says, if you rely on thee, it's like Paul saying in Philippians 4 that he would do uh, things in the power of the one who would strengthen him. 
all things he could do in the power of the one who would strengthen him. He would rely on him. He would lean on the Lord. That's the same word as we found already in chapter 13, verse 18. And the third point in verse 11, I want to underline, let not man prevail against thee. So let's say, uh, an appeal to the Lord. Thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. That's our prayer also, that not uh, Enosh, it's mentioned in the note there, uh, man in his frailty would do anything against God. And then God comes in, in verse 12, Jehovah smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with him pursued them to Gerar, and so there was a great crushing, a great victory, and verse 14 says, for the terror of Jehovah came upon them. That is, after this victory, the terror of the Lord came uh, over those cities in the area that had been under the influence of the enemy. And there was great spoil, and then he brings this into the house of Jehovah, as we see in chapter 15. So now we come to another element in the history of Asa. So we have seen the initial reform, we have seen his great victory, now we see this prophetic message, that is the third point, followed with this covenant and another phase of reform. So this is the third point, how God introduces his thoughts through the prophets. We have mentioned last time, you find so many prophets in the book of Chronicles. The prophets who uh, work on the line of recovery, as we have seen, this is the main theme of the book, God wants to restore his people. And so there's the thought of recovery, and the prophets are very uh, much used by God to speak to the king, to speak to the people in this line of recovery. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah. Azariah means Je Jehovah has help. Wonderful, we have seen his help in the chapter before. And so here is a prophet with this name, Azariah. The son of Oded. Oded means restoration or surrounding. We find then in verse 8 that he is called Oded. So, probably the same prophet who was the son of Oded, but also called Oded in verse 8. Verse 2, he went out to meet Asa. You see, this was after a tremendous victory. And very uh, practical, after a victory, we are in great danger. When we studied the life of uh, Elijah at the Easter Conference, we've seen that after this great victory in 1 Kings 18, then he was an easy prey for these threats of uh, Jezebel. And so, when we have a spiritual victory, we are an easy prey of the enemy. There is a, a great danger for pride or something of the flesh. And so, at that critical moment, the Lord sends the prophet. And so, there is much good coming from this prophetic ministry. It is also preventive. They, often, the prophetic word is preventive. It would prevent Asa to fall into the pitfall of a pride or things like that. And so God's warnings, also for us, they are preventive. God disciplines, we saw yesterday the conference, Titus, the grace of God instructs. The word there means instructing, not only teaching, but also by way of discipline, or by way of chastening. That's how God instructs. And so, here it is to prevent failure, to prevent that something of the flesh would pop up. So that's, another, that's also a form of teaching to prevent uh, that evil would come up. And then, notice, Jehovah is with you. Wonderful! We have seen that already, that Abijah could say this, we have God with us at our head. But then the prophet goes a step further. We have seen those words of pure orthodoxy of Abijah are wonderful, but there is also the side of our responsibility, and that's what the prophet brings out. While ye are with him. That is our responsibility. And I want to underline this, because through the scriptures we see that those two lines, God's line and the line of our responsibility, go hand in hand. They are never mixed together. They are always uh, distinguished. But the two lines go together, like two rail tracks. They belong together. And so, here is emphasis on the responsibility of man. If ye seek him, he will be found of you. That's another word. Sometimes there are these wonderful key words I uh, underlined already. Rely or lean upon the Lord. That's a key word you can follow through the scriptures. Now this word, seek him, follow this through the scriptures and you will be greatly encouraged. Uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's a very practical lesson for each one of us. Young people, older ones, do we seek the kingdom of God first? 
Seek Him. And so, this is a wonderful topic to study. Seek Him, but then really do it, and He will be found. There is the word of the prophet, seek Him while He may be found. That means, uh, take heed that you are put into practice what God uh, says you to do. Because if you don't do that, there may be a time that He will not be found. That's what happened to Israel later, when uh, Samuel warned them, when he wanted to establish a king according to their desires. We were talking about this uh, element of kingdom according to the flesh. Well, that happened later on in the history of Israel. That, and again, we see that in the history of the church, there was rebellion against the Lord's authority. And then Samuel had to warn them. He said, if you do this, there will be a moment that you will cry to the Lord. You can read in First Samuel 8, but the Lord will not hear you. He will not listen to you. Why not? Because you refuse to listen now. So this is a, a very solemn um, appeal and warning. If ye seek him, he will be found. But if you don't do that, there may become a time, there may come a time that we want to seek the Lord, but he will not be found because we have been disobedient, we have hardened ourselves. There is the uh, uh, God's ways in connection with hardening. That's a very solemn topic in the scriptures. If you forsake him, that is in connection with hardening, he will forsake you. His governmental dealing that goes through all the scriptures. And Ezekiel shows how the glory of the Lord departed. God had been very patient, but now he had to forsake them. He had to leave them. Verse 3, now for a long while Israel was without the true God. So here the prophet refers to history past. We have mentioned already God is faithful. God wants to be with his people. But he also is a true God. These words go together. The original word here used can be translated by true, can be translated by the word faithful, because truth and faith in the, intimately are linked together in the scripture. Or the word truth and faithful are very intimately connected. Second Timothy 2, for example. The Lord cannot deny himself. So if we deny him, if we are not faithful, he is always faithful to himself. He wants to be faithful to us. But he cannot be faithful to us if we are unfaithful to him. He cannot deny himself. So that is an important remark of the prophet here. And then secondly, the people was without teaching priest. God wants to instruct his people. We have mentioned the importance of the priesthood. And the priesthood would be there to instruct the people, to teach the people. Uh, Malachi 2, for example, mentioned in Deuteronomy. Several passages emphasize the need for teaching. So there is... The priesthood is that there may be something for God. But in order that this can be done, the people of God needs to be taught. That's what we need. We need the doctrine of the apostles. We need to be taught in order that the priesthood can function. But this, as we have seen, it failed in Israel. They were without the true God because of their unfaithfulness. And also without law. They were a lawless people. And then... In verse 4 he says, but in their trouble they turned to Jehovah. That's what the book of Judges describes in detail. We find it also in Psalm 107, for example, describing the ways of God. That in their distress, then they called on him. And in God's grace, we see that he was with them in their distress. God was with them in the burning bush there. He was with them in the fiery furnace, Daniel's friends. God is with them. And in their trouble... They turn to the Lord. And then notice here, and sought him. I mentioned already, seek him, how important this is in the scriptures. How many times you find it also in the Chronicles, that the people would seek him, and then he was found. How comforting are these words. He was found of them. And these words are a very uh, great comfort for us today. When we seek him, he will be found. But we have seen in First Chronicles there were days under the king Saul that um, they did not seek really after him. So are we really seeking the Lord? Then he will be found. In verse 5, And in those days, in those times, there was no peace to him that went out nor to him that came in. Also in the book of Judges we find it in detail. Such a day of confusion, disorder. And that's where we live today. Days of confusion. And so we have to be brought back to 
uh, these two elements as you have seen the lordship of Christ his headship and then there can be peace the practical peace when we are under his leadership verse 6 and nation was broken against nation and city against city for God disturbed them you see God was dealing with them and judges that is what you find again and again God sent the enemy to attack them he wanted to wake them up as it were through the attacks of the enemy and so they were in great distress and then they called upon the Lord Sometimes the Lord has allowed great, has to allow great distress in our lives before we turn to the Lord for help. But then it's never too late. Let us cry to the Lord for help. Verse 7, but as for you, be firm. Again, that's the same root word we found in strengthening. Let us strengthen ourselves in him. Let us be firm. Sometimes it's called, it's translated as in verse 8, he took courage. He strengthened himself. He took courage. So he listened to the word of the prophet. And his hands were made strong. He heard these words. That's wonderful. Because later on in Asa's life, he rejected the prophetic ministry. So, let us ask this question. Do we listen to the Spirit of God, to the Word of God? Do we listen, take a heed, and listen to prophetic ministry? And there is restoration, as the name Oded means. He strengthened himself, and then he continued this initial... Uh, recovery as we have seen in chapter 14 he went on in this same path and put away the abominations and so on are we faithful if there's something in our life that is not according to the Lord's thought and the Lord shows that we have to cut it out but we have to take that away we have to be obedient we have to put these things into practice now then a few things I want to underline in verse 8 he renewed the altar of Jehovah the altar is the center of worship. And we have already seen in uh, Solomon's ministry, there was great emphasis on the altar. In connection with David, there was great emphasis on the ark. That's what is inside in the presence of God. The altar has to do with uh, God's testimony on this earth. There's a gathering center, as the altar suggests also, as we see in the book of uh, Exodus, the entrance of the tent of meeting here before the porch of Jehovah. So there's a parallel with the wilderness setting. The second point is in verse 9. He assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them. So as we have seen in the, in the days of uh, Rehoboam, in chapter 11, verse 16, that from all the tribes of Israel that set their heart to seek Jehovah, the God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to Jehovah, the God of their fathers. So there we see the separation from uh, the idolatry set up by Jeroboam. And here we see... A similar line, in the next generation, they fell away to him. So they left Jeroboam, or his descendant, and they came out of Israel, so separation, in abundance. So there were multitudes. And why did they do that? They saw that Jehovah, his God, was with him. We have already underlined the expression Jehovah with his people, God with his people. And now others saw this, others from the ten tribes, they saw this and they paid attention. Not only the Levites, because in chapter 11 we have seen the Levites, they wanted to continue their service in connection with the temple. But now it is also others among those tribes who came. So in that sense there is an extension. Not only the Levites, also other members of the people came when they saw that Jehovah's God was with them. And then verse 10, they assembled themselves at Jerusalem in the third month. That's another point. In Exodus 19, where you find the third month in the history of Israel, that is where God made this covenant with them. Of course, there it is in connection with the law. And the people say, said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. Three times they failed. Because they stood there before God on the basis of their own abilities. It could not work. But we can draw lessons from this. The third month for us, Number third is often connected with the resurrection. Secondly, we see in the book of, Act, of Acts, this is where the day of Pentecost was, in the third month. And so here we have also a suggestion of the Feast of Weeks, where uh, in type the assembly comes in, taken from Jews and Gentiles. And uh, so the third month is also important for us. And if you refer back to Exodus, you see that our experiences in the people, the Passover first, and then uh, the second month, the experience in connection with the manna. And then the third month, the covenant with the Lord. 
uh, many things to meditate upon. So we've seen the altar, we've seen the third month here, and then we have the house of God. Because what he did now, he restored really the service of the house of God, because he brought these sacrifices, and when they entered into the covenant, we will see in connection with that, that there is a reviving of God's interest in connection with the house of God, as verse 18 shows. Now, first verse 12, the covenant was to seek Jehovah, the God of their fathers. We have mentioned already the importance of seeking the Lord, but here it is added with all their heart, with all their soul. These expressions are found many times in Deuteronomy, also in connection with the days to come, for, uh, as Jeremiah shows, and for us. Are we really seeking the Lord with all our heart? When our hearts are divided, it will go wrong. God wants a pure heart and a simple eye, undivided heart. And then it says that whoever would not seek, so there's the contrast in verse 13. It reminds me of Paul's anathema in 1 Corinthians 16. Those who would not seek the Lord, or as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, he says, if anyone love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Anathema means a curse. And then he says, Maranatha, the Lord's coming. So in view of the Lord's coming, let's be faithful. Let's love him. Let's seek him. Verse 13, the expression, those who would not seek the Lord, why is this so solemn? Because that implies idolatry. If you don't seek the Lord, it implies that you are going after idols. Verse 14, there is a response. They swore to Jehovah. So they answered this challenge. And they swore to Jehovah with a loud voice, with shouting and trumpets. Uh, there's great emphasis on what was outward. We don't know what happened really in the hearts of the people, of every one of them. So perhaps we might learn a lesson from this. If we say with great emphasis and we swear, and we may very much doubt the sincerity of these things. I'm not saying that this was not sincere. But if we do things like that, emphasize with great outward uh, show, then it's very questionable whether there is uh, sincerity. Whether the, the salt is there. You remember the salt of the covenant? Then verse 15. All Judah rejoiced at the oath. Of course, we are here under, in days under the law, when the people was under the law of Moses. We are not under the law of Moses. That doesn't mean that we are to be lawless. We are under the law of Christ, Galatians 6. But it is a higher law, a law of different order. And so we may enter into that covenant in a sense, uh, may uh, pay attention to the Lord's thoughts and also commit ourselves to his interests. That's a very great commitment that's expressed in an oath. And they sought him with their whole desire. So the whole heart, the whole soul, the whole desire. And notice then, he was found of them. This is God's grace. God's grace. He was found of them. That's why I refer to uh, Isaiah's word, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Verse 15, And Jehovah gave them rest. There's another indication of the rest, which we found already in chapter 14. When there is obedience, God gives rest. We find it also in the book of Judges. And in his obedience, he went on uh, with his restoration process. He eliminated the idol there that his grandmother, because Maka here, verse 16, is really his grandmother. And so, although she was his grandmother, he continued this restoration process and reformation process. And so that shows his consistency, his faithfulness. And uh, he did the same as Moses had done with the golden calf. And then in verse 17, he, there is a reference that he did not remove uh, the high places from Israel. Uh, we don't know whether that refers to places that belong to the ten tribes and that had been occupied now by Asa, or whether this is a reference to sh a shortcomings in connection with places that belong to Judah. We don't know for sure. But it says then only, or yet, Asa's heart was perfect all his days. So that's why he's called the good king. His heart was perfect. Complete with the Lord. Whole. Undivided. That is a great challenge for us also, to have an undivided heart, completely devoted to the Lord's interest. And now notice the house of God comes in the picture. Verse 18. He brought into the house of God the things which his father had dedicated. I find that wonderful. It's not only that the sacrifices are brought 
to the Lord, to the altar, and to his house. But it goes further. The result of his victory is brought to the house. And that is a remedy against evil. I, I may apply it this way. If we have a spiritual victory, we've seen we need the words of the prophets to be kept uh, close to the Lord. But then there's another remedy to bring the results in worship. If we have learned something from the scriptures, if we have learned a lesson in our lives, that we may come to the Lord in true worship. And so then we bring treasures to the house of God. That's what David had done, as we've seen in First Chronicles. And there was no war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa. And then you find a turning point. We'll be brief about that, but that is seen in chapter 16. And we have to put all these chapters together to have the benefit of all these lessons. Because now you see a great failure. Everything went so well. Wonderful. And now there is great failure. Why was this? I have a suggestion. In the book of Jeremiah, uh, you can look it up at home, Chapter 41, verse 9, we see that Asa became afraid. He got scared. If he got scared for the enemy, we're an easy prey. That is how the enemy works. But being scared is really a form of selfishness. It's a form of selfishness. This fear is not reverence for the Lord. He had taken it up against uh, this uh, mighty army of the Ethiopians. And now he was scared for an army that was much smaller. So this is a selfish fear. And I say, you have to read Jeremiah 41, verse 9, to see that there was this fear. Not a godly fear, but a selfish fear. And so there is this element of selfishness that came in. This is where we easily go astray. When instead of uh, focusing on the Lord's interests, we start to focus on our own interests. Uh, Paul says, all have left me and seek their own things. Not... Or they don't seek Christ's interest, they seek their own interest. And Second Timothy, uh, many references to that. So this is a deviation. And the results are very tragic. We see then, what he did, instead of bringing treasures to the house of God, he took now these treasures away. What a tragedy this is. He did not ask God's counsel. He just, because of his fear, he counseled in, him all, in himself, or perhaps with his counselors, but there was no faith. As we have seen Earlier, there was faith. And so he made an alliance with this wicked king of Syria, which would be a very great plague uh, on the nation later on. Because of this alliance, the king, uh, this uh, Syrian king, he dropped his, uh, this Baasha, and then Baasha had to retract. And so then Asa benefited from this, and uh, he built Ramah uh, in verse 5. He, oh, excuse me, he left off building Rama. Rama here is a uh, fortified place, and that was to mark the division between the kingdom. Now the people could not go uh, anymore uh, through the hill country there to Jerusalem. We have to understand this was a hill country, and so if there was a city there that would block the roads, nobody could pass. So we've seen that in chapter 15, many people went to the two tribes to dwell with them, to live with them, and to serve the Lord with them. And so ba Basha, he wanted to stop that, and he built Ramah. And there's another reference in Jeremiah, in connection with Rachel. Rachel wept. Why did she weep? Because of her children. Because here we see the Ephraimites. Ephraim is one of Joseph's uh, sons. And so, son of Rachel. And Benjamin was with Judah. And that was the other side, the two tribes. And so, there they were in conflict, one with the other. And Rama was built to underline this separation. Baasha did not want any people to go to the two tribes. Rachel weeps. That is Jeremiah, what a prophet thinks about it. God's people divided. And we have to weep because of the division among the people of God. But, now another prophet comes in verse 7. We close with this uh, passage. Hanani, the seer, came. And it, as I listened to him, what does the prophet say? Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria. What a contrast is what we saw earlier. Under Abijah, they relied on the Lord. Asa in his early days had relied on the Lord. But now, he relied on the king of Syria, a wicked king. He had not relied on the Lord. Can this happen to us? Yes. How easy can this happen that we would be motivated by fear or selfishness 
and would rely on something else outside the Lord. And so he, sh- he the prophet shows the folly of this action in verse 8. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? But when thou didst rely on Jehovah, he delivered them into thy hand. And now notice verse 9. This is a key verse in this book. For the eyes of Jehovah run to and fro through the whole earth. Like in Ezekiel's day when he saw the glory of the Lord, we see many details that explain to us how this works, how God in his government looks and his eyes run over the whole earth. He seeks. God is also looking. He's also seeking. He looks whether there are faithful people among his uh, among the men, mankind. People with whom he can identify himself. God is looking also. We have seen there were those who were looking for the Lord. They were seeking the Lord. But God on his side is also looking. And he looks also whether there is unfaithfulness or faithfulness. And then he shows himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect. We have seen the importance of the heart. I cannot stress that enough. A pure, undivided heart. A perfect heart that is completely for the Lord, that relies on him. But as I had failed here, it still it was not too late to confess this. He could have uh, paid attention to the words of the prophet. Very psalm words, very challenging words. But what do we read? He did not respond in a proper way. His response was negative. He rejected the warning of the prophet. He was rough with them. There was no repentance. There was rebellion now in the king, in the good king. This can happen to us. When we have done something for the Lord, the other moment... There can be rebellion. Peter, you received a revelation from the Father. This is the Messiah. This is the Son of the living God. The next moment, he spoke against the Lord. He was a vessel of the enemy. And next to that, Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time, who probably people that agreed with the prophet. And so what is the conclusion in verse 11? The acts of Asa, first and last. That's also very practical to us. The eyes of the Lord, they look at us when we are young. Perhaps we are very motivated for the Lord's interest when we are young. But what about when we are older? What about the last days? Paul speaks about the last days in 2 Timothy. He did not change his faithfulness to the Lord, although the last days had come. So what about us? Our first days and last days. What would God write about them in his book? And so then we see that in these last days, he did not turn back to the Lord. No, his feet... Had, wrong, had gone the wrong way, verse 12. And so God chastised him. He diseased him in his feet. That's God's way of discipline. If we don't want to listen, God ch- chastens his people in order to bring him back. He could still come back. He could still come back after the words of the prophet. He could still come back here in this disease. But he did not. That is the tragedy. He did not seek Jehovah, but the physicians. Now, word of warning here, that doesn't mean that we should never go and see a doctor. The the physicians in those days, they were often connected with sorcery. So it would be wrong anyway to go and see a physician connected with sorcery. But the point is that he did not seek the Lord at all, but tried to find his help with the physicians. And that would be wrong, of course, if he would go to a very good doctor, but then forsake the Lord, it would also be wrong. How much more it would be wrong if we would only seek our help with people who are involved in occult things. And so, verse 14, we see that he had excavated a sepulcher for himself. That's where the deviation started. Selfish fear. Here's where it ends. He made even a sepulcher for himself. It was great display of things like spices and perfumer's art and all these things. Great burning was made for him, but he was not brought back to the Lord. Although he was a good king. So here we have a psalm warning, very practical to us. We may be good Christians, go on for the Lord uh, in our lives. But are we listening to the prophetic word? Are we judging ourselves? Are we correcting ourselves when it's needed? Or are we hardening ourselves like this king did at his late days? So I apologize, it was a bit longer tonight than usual. But um, uh, we'll try to make it shorter the next time. But I felt we should take this whole section in one in order to have the uh, complete outline before us. But um, I, I would like to give an opportunity for questions. That's beautiful. You remember verse 11, these three points I tried to underline. Faith, and that is expressed in those words that you quote. And then that he relied on him, 
and then also that he appealed to the Lord, Thou art our God. So we may appeal to the Lord. If we are with him, we may make such appeals. But if we are not faithful, if we are not with him, we cannot make such appeals. Is that not a great tragedy? That on the one hand, he had accumulated things for the Lord, and now he takes them away. But that can happen to us. I mean, we are not better than this king. So that's a great challenge for us. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. I, I wanted to comment on that also, but I forgot in verse 7, uh, he has given us rest on every side, and they built and prospered. That's exactly what you find in the book of Acts there. That's what I meant. Perhaps it was mere orthodoxy. And so that is also why I said in verse 14, the fact that it said they cried to Jehovah, not, it's not said that Abijah cried. So perhaps we can make that conclusion. But I want to be very careful uh, with making these conclusions, because I don't want to take away anything of the beautiful words that he says. But beautiful words in themselves, as you say, are not sufficient. Uh, we need to have real faith. And that's the test. So may the Lord help us to pass the test. We can do it only in his strength. Thank you.